Welcome everyone to our Good Friday uh, message time. It's uh, good to be part of your worship at home. Uh, I've got Tim and the boys here and uh, Joy's been helping on the organ. Uh, welcome. Our focus this morning on Good Friday is on Matthew chapter 27 verses 32 to 66. It's the last in the series, uh, Jesus Last Week. Our theme is, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather together, even remotely like this, and to hear your message spoken. Speak to each one of us this morning and remind us of what you did for us out of love through your son Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I ask you, were you there when they crucified my Lord? It's uh, uh, an old Afro-American song, you probably know it. Uh, the words go, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the verses go on and ask, were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? And so on. This morning I want you to imagine that you're one of the people at the foot of the cross uh, watching as Jesus is crucified. No more than that, I want you to imagine you're one particular person at the foot of the cross, namely the centurion. Uh, the centurion was a Roman officer in command of uh, a century of soldiers, a hundred soldiers. And uh, he and his soldiers would have been stationed in the Antonio Fortress, which was found in the northwest corner of the temple court. What would this centurion have known about Jesus? Well, I'm sure he would have known that Jesus was a miracle worker. That would have been gossiped about in Jewish society. And maybe even the centurion had heard about a fellow centurion having his servant healed. Uh, I've been reading a book of monologues on the characters who were involved in the events surrounding uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is the part of the monologue of the centurion. This Jesus had quite a reputation. Another centurion told me that Jesus had healed his ailing servant. There were other fantastic takes about his healing powers. Some said that he'd fed thousands with a few fish and several loaves of bread, and that the amount left over was far more than that they began with. He could apparently command the stormy waters on the lake to subside, people reported, and those people went as far to claim that he had actually called a man from Bethany back to life. Whatever the centurion knew about Jesus, one thing's clear, he would have heard about Jesus and some of the amazing things that Jesus had done. Uh, he would have heard that Jesus was a miracle worker. That's a clip from the Matthew DVD where Jesus uh, heals the servant of uh, the, this other centurion remotely. What else would the centurion have known about Jesus? Um, surely that Jesus wasn't well liked uh, by the Jewish authorities. Uh, the centurion would have been around, would have heard about Jesus being hurled, uh, being brought before uh, the chief priest, namely Caiaphas, and Caiaphas asked him uh, on oath, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus said, so you say. And he was condemned for blasphemy, and he was taken before uh, Pilate. You can see the Jewish leaders there by Pilate. Uh, they were well and truly at the forefront of everything, uh, trying to get Jesus condemned. Let me continue reading from this centurion's monologue in this book that I have. He was not well received by the religious authorities, yet he was a fervent practicing Jew. 
I don't know what they disliked about him, except that he never yielded to their trickery. The Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the chief priests arranged for Jesus to be arrested, paying one of the man's own disciples to betray him, after which the Nazarene was eventually uh, crucified. So uh, the centurion would have known that Jesus was a miracle worker, that he wasn't well liked by the Jewish authorities, and that Jesus had made certain claims about himself. He would have known that. In fact, he would have been there uh, before Pilate when Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews, like they say? And again, Jesus said, so you say. And uh, there's Jesus before Pilate. And this is the title uh, that was put, nailed to the cross by the soldiers under the centurion. It reads in three languages, Hebrew at the top, uh, in the middle Latin, and down the bottom Greek, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews is what it says. So uh, the centurion would have been well aware of the claims that Jesus was making about himself. Furthermore, Matthew tells us people passing by shook their heads and hurled insults at Jesus. You are going to tear down the temple and build it up again in three days. Save yourself if you're God's son. So the centurion would have been well aware of uh, the claims. And later when Jesus was on the cross, uh, uh, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders were jeering at him, uh, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Isn't he the so-called Messiah? Isn't he the King of the Jews? Uh, if he comes down off the cross, we will believe in him. He trusts in God and claims to be God's son. Well then, let's see if God wants him to save him now. So that's what the centurion would have known about Jesus. What had led him after the death of Jesus to cry out, he really was the Son of God. Um, maybe the centurion was impressed by the way that uh, Jesus handled himself before Pilate. Uh, we're told that he didn't say a word. When Jesus was dressed up as a king by the soldiers, by the soldiers under the centurion, uh, the centurion would have observed how Jesus handled everything uh, without fear. Uh, a crown of thorns was put on his head, a purple robe on him, and he was given a, a staff, a stickers, a king's staff, he was blindfolded too, we're told in another gospel, and people hit him and said, guess who hit me? If you're a prophet, you know who hit you. And on the way to Golgotha, the, uh, the centurion and the soldiers would have been there, and the centurion would have seen the way that Jesus went to the cross carrying his cross beast. Although along the way he fell down from blood loss, I guess, because he'd been whipped crawling with 39 lashes, and that's with a whip impregnated with bone and metal, and a cut you to pieces that could kill you. Anyway, Jesus was nailed to the cross, and the centurion would have seen Jesus on the cross, and heard the things that Jesus said on the cross. And I guess the thing that would have struck most of the centurion was Jesus praying to God about uh, the soldiers and the centurion. Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, Father. At 12 o'clock on that Friday, a huge darkness came over the land, which lasted for three hours. Now, this wasn't an eclipse. It was Passover time. And at Passover time, the moon is full. Uh, so there's no chance of an eclipse then. Maybe it was a huge sandstorm that God had raised up. Whatever, it was a seemingly supernatural sign that something was happening with Jesus on the cross. 
At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eli, Eli, lemma sacrifani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus was uh, experiencing uh, the blackness that the blackness around was emphasizing. He was experiencing hell. He was experiencing the suffering and the judgment and the punishment that we deserve from God. And he was taking it on himself. Uh, the only one who did, didn't deserve God's judgment, God's son, took that punishment, that judgment on himself. But back to the centurion. Uh, as Jesus died, uh, we're told there was a huge earthquake. Uh, another supernatural sign that something amazing was happening with Jesus suffering and dying on the cross. Uh, this led the centurion to cry out, he really was the Son of God. He really was the Son of God. Let me read to you from this monologue again where uh, the centurion speaks about what he experienced. At noon the sky was blackened with the most dismal clouds I've ever seen. It was dark as night and everyone became afraid. I heard Jesus cry out with a loud voice some garbled words and then he breathed his last. And at that instant it was as if the whole earth was shuddering from grief. There was a quake that caused fissures in the ground one that zigzagged across Calvary from the cross of, to the Pharisees themselves, like the accusing finger of God. You should have heard them cry out in fear. Later, someone came running to say that the temple curtain covering their most holy place was ripped from top to bottom in the tremor. And as I said, it culminates with this cry from the centurion. Truly, this man was the Son of God. I guess the question that flows from this is, did the centurion uh, come to faith in Jesus as the Son of God and our Saviour who suffered and died for our sins? Um, did he become a follower of Jesus after that? Well, we don't know. We're not told. Uh, that's the last we hear of the centurion uh, in the uh, Gospels and the letters and the uh, Acts of the New Testament. I guess the most important question is the question that God's asking us this morning. Where are you at with regard to Jesus? Have you come to faith in Jesus as the Son of God and as your Saviour who suffered and died on the cross for your sins? Have you listened to Jesus and what he says about himself? Have you seen the signs? The centurion saw the signs, the, uh, the blackness from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock and uh, the earthquake that happened. Have you seen the signs, uh, the miracles that Jesus did and which are recorded in the Gospels? Uh, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday. They're signs from God uh, pointing us to who Jesus is, that he is God's Son, that he is our Saviour, as he claimed. Are you a follower of Jesus who said of himself, I am the way to God, I am the truth. If you want to know the truth about things, listen to me. I am the life. I am the one who gives life in all its fullness and eternal life. Let's finish up. Um, Today is Good Friday, as no doubt you are aware. It's a good day despite the sadness that happened on that, good fr on that Friday so long ago when Jesus was horribly crucified. It's a good day uh, because it's a day that Jesus suffered and died there for you and for me, for everyone, and for you and for me. And uh, by his suffering and death for us, our life has been changed as we receive for ourselves what Jesus did for everyone. As we trust in Jesus, as we come to God and say, Dear God, forgive me. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. That's the prayer of faith. 
Our whole life has been changed. And also the way that we face our future. I was just reading in uh, Act Lynn that uh, Viv edited and she was uh, talking about giving an illustration uh, about, I can't remember it exactly, but you can look it up in the Act Lynn uh, about feeding our faith or feeding our fears. We need to feed our faith and remind ourselves that we have a saviour, that we are right with God, to remind ourselves through Jesus that uh, God loves us and is caring for us and to remind ourselves through Jesus that we don't have to be afraid of suffering and death because death will take us home to be with our Lord Jesus, with our Heavenly Father, with all God's forgiven children. In your service orders, there's the song, Nothing But The Blood Of Jesus. I love it. It's an old song, which has been used more recently. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the death of Jesus for me. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. May God bless you as you celebrate Easter, as you celebrate the death of Jesus for you, and on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, God be with you.